Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Welcome to the third episode of the Braden Anderson Show. I have some amazing guests here with me today. Got starting with my on my right, we have Victor Allegria. He's the GM of Obseeking Capital and a variety of different concepts uh, underneath that, including Kook Burger, Kook Burger and Bar, Black Turtle Coffee, and Jester Castle, which is going to be open in the next couple months. And then we have Price More Hollow, who is the head chef of Kook Burger and Kook Burger and Bar. Mm -hmm. And then to my left, I have my man, Christian Correa, who is kind of like a, the head head bar guy. What, what are you? What do you do <laughs> at Kook Burger and Bar? Uh, we're working on a title. Um, right now, just just whatever whatever it takes at the moment. Whatever it takes. And, and a title will emerge. He's the man. He he's absolutely the man. What doesn't he do? He does a lot of things. He he puts out fires. He solves problems. <laughs> um, and for those that do not know yet, uh, I'm one of the the owners of of these establishments. And these fine gentlemen uh, have been invaluable in in building this these businesses and in building this uh, seeking capital empire that uh, that that we're trying to build. So. Um, it's, it's an honor to have you guys here. Uh, I want to talk a lot about the industry, just the restaurant industry, entrepreneurship, what goes into this. It's, it's really hard, right? There's a lot of people who think, I want to start a restaurant, right? Like, who, yeah. who doesn't want to start a restaurant, right. right? I know for me, the passion came literally from, like, as an attorney, like, when you start making money, I was in poverty, and then I have some money to spend. When you're in poverty and you're hungry, you want to spend your first dollar on food, on good food, right? And be able to enjoy what you eat and what you drink and be treated well, the hospitality, right? Like that industry brings a lot. Um, and I kind of just want to go around the room and like get a sense for what that the industry means to you and, and what uh, has, has made you gravitate towards it. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start, right? Because I was the first one introduced. Started off. Um, I guess for me, man, it started off as like that old school American dream. My parents, they came here over, they came from Mexico over to the United States, and their whole, you know, goal was to own their own thing, which, at, you know, at the end of the day became a little breakfast shop in Atlantic City, where we're from. And, you know, they ran with it for like two years. It wasn't successful. But, you know, when they purchased it, I was around 12 years old, and that's when I got in the restaurant industry, right? And it was just something that just was, like, ingrained in me, right? You start to work and what your parents do, and this is what they were they set forth for themselves, and it's like you adopt your parents' dreams. And you kind of either you roll with it or you make your own dreams. And for me, it was just something I was good at, so I just stuck with it. And, and I'm here now, you know, I'm in working with couple of fine gentlemen which share this they share the same passion and it's kind of you know it's it's a kind of surreal thing when you meet people that have the same passion for the same kind of things because you know and all of us in the same room talking about it which is kind of cool so that's how it worked for me right what i happened? was born into it and then i kept going what happened to the restaurant i didn't even know what's that. it called the thing so it was called cup and saucer and Up it and used saucer. to, yeah, it used to be where Ducktown is at, where you guys were. No in way. The same, <laughs> in the same really? building. What? And the guy who, On the corner? On the corner. What? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, obviously moves cool. happen. And uh, they tried to recreate the same restaurant down the street in the same city. But it was just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for them, right? They were not um, as successful as other people when it came to running restaurants. I want to get back to that and talk more about that and kind of unpack what you think might have been some of the reasons that it didn't work out and, and some, some things that you might have done differently in hindsight. Um, but Price, why don't you uh, give us your, your two cents? Um, what was the question? <laughs> what makes you gravitate towards the industry? Like, why do you love cooking? I mean, uh, I've always loved cooking and I've always just like been pretty like infatuated with with food and just fascinated with 
everything that goes into cooking something spectacular, right? Like, whether it's just, like, I don't, like, the best peanut butter and jam sandwich you've ever had or, like, a fine, like, duck ragu at, at a, you know, white tablecloth fine dining restaurant, like, um, <clears throat> it just, <clears throat> it's always, it's always been something that, that I've, like, been obsessed with, low-key, like, whether, whether, whether I like to admit it or not, you know, it's, it's just, that's something that I've always gravitated to, and, you know, as you know, uh, throwback. Remember my first job working at mm. uh, Mary Brown's Chicken. Yeah. Shout out, shout out, Mary Brown's Chicken. Uh, Nobody knows what that <laughs> is, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it sounds good though. Mary Brown's <laughs> Chicken. If you know, you know. Is a oh, I don't want to disrespect them, but like mm. kind of a poor man's Chick Fil A, <laughs> right? Yeah. I okay. mean, you know, they mm. were. They I would do even their say thing. it's like a, it's it's even like a poor man's KFC, like yeah, poor poor man's yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you know, less poor <laughs> KFC, because um, I'm not a big KFC guy. But um, no, I feel you. I feel yeah. you. Is it more about like seeing people's reactions and 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 making people happy through food? I mean, or is it more about the art? I guess it started off as just like, you know, the way that it made me feel. Um, I just wanted to really capture that and kind of like recreate that in, in any way possible. So, uh, you know, it started off as a hobby, just learning, like, the basics. Like, I remember when I, like, first learned how to make pasta by myself mm. at home, and it was, like, a game changer. I was like, oh, my God, like, I can make pasta, like, this easy, and it's this I easy. don't have to call mom. I can do right, this. Right, like, just boil some water, put some noodles in the john, and, uh... Like, from scratch, or you, like, you meant you no, made a pasta no, dish? No, 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 This is the basic. I got bro. excited when you said you made it okay. from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> we got there eventually. Okay. We got there eventually, but, no, it started off with the basics. Um, and, yeah, you know, it's the art form. It's being creative. It's, you know, working with what you got in the kitchen, making every ingredient count. And, um, you know, when, when you start to learn the, the chemistry of different types of ingredients like salt, acid, fat, you know, heat, spice, th those, those four compound ingredients or flavors, I guess, um, it's beautiful when you can, like, master that. And, and they work together and they counteract each other in, in different ways. And, you know, like... The art form, like you said, like it's it, there's nothing better than when I make a dish for someone and I see someone taking a picture of it. Right. Like that's like my whole thing. Like I just that makes me sleep good. You know what I mean? Yeah. People appreciating your art. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it is. And I think it's interesting, like from from Victor's standpoint, at least in in each of our respective roles right now, um, we've all had many roles right in the industry and outside of the industry. But like Victor being GM, front of house management thinking about dollars and cents, thinking about food costs, thinking about server management, thinking about how the operation runs as a whole and plugging in the right pieces in the right places. And then you think about price as the artist behind it all, making sure that every dish that comes out reflects the art in, in, in the way that you designed it to be enjoyed, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Christian, your role it's it's a little bit different, right? I think your skill set is is really focused on the customer and the customer's experience. And like, talk to us about your your experience and and how how you got here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you you mentioned like the, the love of the industry. It's actually in a weird way. I've been and part of me has been fighting tooth and nail to get out of it. And and part of that is is you know. This industry is really interesting because a, a lot of people will see people in a, as a server or bartender. It's like, oh, it's not a real job. But I know people making six six figures a year mm -hmm. with running families, own homes. Like, they're doing great. But I, um, one of the things for me was um, realizing, in hindsight, like all the opportunities this this industry has allowed me to do, all the freedoms I've had, all the creativity, the ability to meet so many different people in so many different industries, and what a blessing that's been. Uh, um, I, I kind of like landed on me recently and it's, it, it's, it's taken a really nice turn. So what I really like is being in this industry since probably as long as Victor, 20 something years back when I remember I worked at a little breakfast place 
And this is back when the cook would be in there with like a wife beater smoking a cigarette over the soup. <laughs> like you could do it. It was wild. This is like the early 90s. <laughs> Price still does that. Not a Coop Burger, Philadelphia. Not a Coop Burger. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. Not at the restaurant. PSA. Yeah, so it's like... So it's just this lengthy... You know, being in the industry so long, it's really cool to, to be on this side of it and to embrace, like, the uh, management ownership side of it is um, having that experience in on the front lines with the customer to be able to be like, hey, I can spot when somebody's not having a great time. I can spot when the food, like, there, there's, there's like, a, a looking for it that you've had all this experience in, and it, and it ends up more valuable than you thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Just, like, uh, the ability to speak with staff and understand their needs, know when they're upset, know when the guests are upset or when they're feeling good and how to kind of um, create a holistic place where, where you can get the best out of everybody and for everybody. What kind of, are there any rules or, or strategies that are hard and fast in your mind? Like I heard very recently, cause I'm always reading up and, and trying to make up for the fact that I don't have 20, 30 years of, of experience in the industry. I have the passion for the industry and I, I want to create an amazing restaurant and, and create the best experience possible for customers. And I, you know, I have my ways that, that I've tried to approach doing that, which we'll talk about. But like one thing I read recently was that, um, you know, every server, whether it's two bites or two minutes, Mm -hmm. you should approach the table and, and ask how things are going and ask how things are tasting. Um, one, do you agree with that? And two, are there any other hard and fast rules like that that, that you think are, are effective? It's interesting. Uh, two, well, so two minutes, two bites, it just it, t- that's a microcosm of the entirety of just always being aware of your guests, anticipating guest needs. So, yeah, a, a plate drops and you want to make sure they got what they wanted. It came out the way they wanted it. They're not missing anything. They're not in need of anything. And then that's just when the meal comes. But that's also when they walk in when they order drinks, when they need their check, like just the whole looking for not just your table, but everybody's table, even the staff, like what's needed, just right. having the eye for that. So as as far as hard and fast rules, there's probably uh, hundreds of them that are applicable. But what I really think is more important, you know, you have, we had like the, the book of cook, we have the values and stuff. And I, what I think is really more important is to um, lead with and to embody the values that you want and and become a place where that's uh, that's a way of being, because right. you can teach somebody the the menu, you can teach somebody the logistics of waiting tables, mm-hmm. but to have people that have that care and that hospitality and that want to be there, the understanding that we're we're trying to create something great for everybody, for the customers, for ourselves. You know, we want them to be happy, we want the food to be good, we want to make money, we want the owners to be happy, and if you can really have an eye for that. Um, that's kind of a, a more of a virtue value based thing. And then the, the little stuff you kind of learn along the way. So I think that's the, the most important. For sure. For sure. Vic, like from a management standpoint, like thinking about your own family's restaurant, what, what are some things going back to that, revisiting that, what are some things that you think went wrong there in, in hindsight? And, you know, you, you were 12. So if, if you don't know, uh, really, or, or can't remember, that's fine. But just trying to learn from that like yeah i mean it's like you know it of course the number one thing was location right once that was a prime location you know 20 something years ago right it's like two blocks away from the expressway there was a bar there that was 24 hours so you know people would go there and it was just a staple like they didn't make that restaurant what it was that restaurant was already mm. an establishment and they were just able to buy it out right and then just keep continuing the operation so it wasn't something that was incepted from them off the beginning but you know like uh, you know, <clears throat> then the circumstances right and then they decide to move down to a different location with a bigger restaurant and it's just harder you know the 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 change and and how big the seats were and trying to fill all those seats up you know uh adding you know it, it's weird because there's a lot of pizzerias in Atlantic City so you go from you, you, they kind of lost their idea of a restaurant, right? Their concept. They went from selling breakfast, like good, delicious, comfort food breakfast, to now you're adding pizza, wings, cheesesteaks. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, what are you? Like, what's right. your identity, right? And now you're just not open from like six in the morning to four. Now you're open close to like two in the morning because you want to get that late night crowd. And, right. and it just was, it was a lot of changes that weren't, benef- you know, they weren't benefiting 
my parents, right? Mm-hmm. And you can't please everybody. You can't please everybody, Try. and they were trying to. You know, they were trying to cater to all these different, you know, uh, clientele that were coming in, and and they lost focus of what they were good at, right? Which was eggs, pancakes, you know, hash browns. It sounds simple, but like he, there's some breakfast spots that they even kind of missed the mark on that stuff, right? And it was just. Uh, now it's like there's not a, there's not a lot of uh, people that they're too prideful, right? They just want to stick to what they know. They don't want to learn anything new, mm-hmm. you know. It, it's like I think like two three weeks ago, my mom still has a coffee shop, right? And she she loves it, and she just now got an Instagram, you know. And it's something she could have done a couple of years ago, but it's that pride thing. Like no, I no, I have a business. I ran a business before, and this is how it works, and this is the only way it works. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Like not only my parents' business, but I see a lot of like. People that come here with the same dream, like, I want to own my own thing, they don't like to adapt, you know? And, and that's, you know, it's unfortunate because that that's a lot of the, the people that fail, right? They don't want to, it's not because they didn't try, right? Or they tried too hard or whatever the case is, they just don't want to learn new, new things, new tricks, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the saying is adapt or die, right? right? But I think you brought up a lot of really interesting things about identity, mm-hmm. the importance of of understanding what your identity is. But I think it's even bigger than that because it's also about understanding identity and brand and how that relationship works and where your place is in the marketplace. I think that's the piece that I bring. I think that's my focus, Um, more high level. What are all of the brands in this particular area with similar identities? What are they all doing well? What are they all not doing well? And how can I be disruptive and be the concept, create the concept that causes the incumbents to either adapt or die, Mm -hmm. right? Because the disruption is super important, but you do find examples, and I've seen this a ton in my research, of restaurants that are historic. They do things the same way. They've done them the same way for 100 years. Mm. And they have it so dialed in that it doesn't matter. Mancos and Mancos, Ocean City, I think got to shout them out because I think they're an example of like a nearly 100-year-old pizzeria that does they do things a particular way the, you go in there everyone's dressed the same they do the little they do the little dough toss they like they're regimented they do things the same way people will reasonable minds could have reasonable minds and palates could have a different view on whether it's the best pizza ever or not i think it's pretty dang good but Regardless of of what any of us think subjectively, they are killing it, yeah. right? If, if someone's open for a hundred years, right? It's hundred years, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knife mean, and fork is another pretty good example. Something right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. And so and then it's like why change? change? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I think it's Keep kind it of simple. I think it's kind of an interesting mix, right? Because you have the adapter dies a, a great way, right? There there are times where you're going to have to, you can't, you can't bullhead your way through things that aren't working, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, whether it's a menu, and it's actually, it's a Seth Godin thing too. It's like, it's better to thrash early. It's better to like play with your identity early and, and then land on something that works and stick with it. But it really is like some of those institutions, you know, if you think of like Pink's Hot Dogs and, and it, it, there's some places that just become a place that you have to try when you go there, whether they're yeah. even good or not. Right. It's like, it's like, it's almost like winning mm-hmm. the lottery though. Like you can't, It'd be interesting to see if there was a formula to become a Pink's Hot Dog or become a Sprinkles Cupcakes, right? To be the thing that's like, White there's House a subs. line for it just because it's on a list of the 10 things you have to do in this place, right? So I'm not really sure about that, but I think in terms of like, you know, I was launching a, a thing and, and having that identity, I think it's really, it's good to be like honing it right now as we're new. You know, what is what are we? What are we doing? What are the things that we do well and often and consistently right. that people go that you know you talked about the the mega mancos the thing yeah. it's it's not just the food it's pizza there's a thousand right. pizza shops what do i feel when i go there what am i experiencing yeah. what's the thing here that makes it special for me or my family or whatnot well, it, i mean well it's like you just said it's consistent right in all those places that were mentioned mm-hmm. it's like they're consistent at the one thing they're good at right yeah. you don't go to mac and mancos and ask for a cheeseburger yeah i'm not going there to get a cheeseburger and i'm not going to you know, sprinkles cupcakes for a soft serve ice cream. Like, I know what I'm going for because they've been doing it for so long. They're consistently good. And they have that mindset, like, we're not changing what we're doing because it's working. So, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's how those 100-year 
like institutions or restaurants. Doc's Oyster House has been in Atlantic City since I don't know when, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like it's killing it. They're, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's 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 a great, great restaurant, right? And they haven't changed anything really. I mean, you know, yeah, they're it, they're they're very consistent. I mean, I I admire the the Dougherty family a lot. Um, you know, they they really have created that restaurant empire mm-hmm. in the Atlantic City area, um, and I think. You have to both as a as a disruptor, as a new player in the game that wants to succeed, you have to both have reverence for those that have come before you, but also have the chip on your shoulder that you want to take everybody out. Yeah. And you know, you're not so starstruck that you're not ready to to go for the jugular, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's an interesting dynamic to juggle, right? Like when you think about it. Price, Victor, you know, whoever wants to jump in, what goes into trying to really execute in in a way that you do go viral? Like, you know, you mentioned there's no ingredient list to become a Sprinkles Cupcake, to become a Mancos and Mancos, to become McDonald's, right? Like McDonald's, say what you will about them, extremely, extremely successful, right? They know what they're doing. They know what they're delivering. They're not delivering a kook bur- a kook burger mm. right they're not delivering a kook burger they're not delivering the kind of quality that 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 we're packing um but they have a very regular consistent product for mm. a very regular average consumer mm. that knows what they want um and it's going to fill you up right mm. it's about that efficiency i think like you ever seen that movie, The Founder? It's a great movie. <laughs> yeah, so, like, when they're, like, in the kitchen and, like, planning out, like, how stuff's going to work and, like, all right, like, how can we, like, um, you know, do this the best way? Like, okay, he's here and then he spins around and he does that. And they're, like, drawing it out and, like, doing, like, the dance, mm-hmm. you know? Like, well, you get that dialed in and you have something that works that's good that people like in, an, in a quick and efficient matter. And <clears throat> it's about, like, consistency, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, you want to have that thing that someone likes. You want them to come back next week and have the exact same thing and not be any different. It doesn't matter who it is. You know, if you had a 10-year vet back there cooking or you have, you know, new guy on his first day doing it, you know, you got to have that that standard, right, that, that, that standard dialed in so that when they come through, they know exactly what they're going to get because they love that. That's what they're here for, right? So <clears throat> I think that's the most important thing, just uh, consistency. Yeah, chasing some form of consistency always. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I, I think as, like, the, uh, the FOH guy from the house, I think it's a little bit more detailed, right? Like, mm. y- y- I always say this, like, when I'm speaking to servers, I'm like, if somebody comes in and they have a soup and it's not good, Somebody probably messed the recipe up. They're going to come back the next week and try it, right? But if they have bad service, most likely they're not going to come back because people are, you know, they, they they don't like bad service, right? And, you know, obviously I think with the consistency and efficiency, you know, you having a team which can, you know, bring everything in together, right? Like you walk in the restaurant and a lot of people don't notice. Like I can't really go out to eat anymore because I notice everything, you know, um, glassware, <laughs> you know. The thing on the floor, like the way the hostess opens the door, mm. you know, people, the way people answer the phone, and just the same stuff way like, with food. Like, yeah, I'm so a food snob. Exactly. You I know, got the nachos last night, and I was like, eh, it's like these kind of criticizing suck. everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, ours are better. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's like I, I feel yeah. like it's just a whole uh, array of things, right? But d- I definitely agree with the efficiency, the consistency. If mm-hmm. everything's consistent mm-hmm. across the board. Like, you walk in, the ambiance is consistent, the music, the lighting, right? The silverware, the glassware, right. the, the the food and the service and all that across the board. I think people... It's important. It, it yeah. is, yeah. You got to have that vibe. People, people come for the vibe. Right. And if they like it, they want to come yeah. back. And if, you know, if they come one time and it's a certain way and then they come the next time and it's different, yeah. it's going to be a letdown, right? You're going to be disappointed by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've I've seen the studies. I mean, the studies unequivocally do say that whether your food is average or above average, you can make money in mm-hmm. the business. Mm-hmm. If you're consistently average, mm-hmm. you will make money. Mm-hmm. If you're consistently above average, you're going to make money. 
even if you're consistently below average, you're going to make money. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Especially if you're priced accordingly. Right. But if you are above average one day, average the next day, below average the next day, above average the next day, excellent the day after that, you can't make money. You cannot be successful because you're not going to target the right audience of customers. Mm -hmm. Because there's a there's a place for you in in the market. Mm -hmm. There's a consumer that you're there for. Mm -hmm. you, you're priced accordingly, right? And I think consistency. That's obviously consistency is the name of the game. It's what you're trying to do. It's easier said than done. Yeah. Right. Especially when you're trying to duplicate efforts. So it's easier said than done. Right. Mm -hmm. To execute on consistency day in and day out. Right. And part of it is how do you duplicate yourself when price is in the kitchen I, and he's doing every single job, which is impossible. Right. <laughs> what I, I would like have a lot octopus? of. Right. Like <laughs> if you're an octopus and you can do every job, he can be on prep. He can be on bun sets. He can be on grill. He can be fry guy. I he, wish I was an octopus. If you can do it all, you have consistency. Perfect every time because you are controlling it all mm -hmm. but i think the hardest thing once you become a manager a leader an owner a head chef a gm you can't do it all you have a general you have values right the, we talked about the book of kook right we have this this book where we've tried to memorialize and document what our value system is as a business as a restaurant um, what we want all of our employees to embody um, and try to give some some tips and some instructions that are more specific and detailed in terms of how to actually make that happen. But at the end of the day, you have to rely on people that you don't know that well, that you just hired, that maybe they have a decent resume, but they probably don't share the vision in the same way that you share the vision as an owner. Like Gary V, for example, talks a lot about you can't expect employees to treat your business like an owner. You can't expect employees to be like owners, right? And there's a lot of owners who kind of expect that and they're consistently let down, right? Because it's like they're they're not going to they're, they're never going to do that, right? right. Um and l but like how do you still become successful when you know that you're not going to get the maybe the same level that you'd get out of yourself. How do you manage through that and create systems to to make that consistent quality and and product happen? I mean, I think you just said it right there. It's systems, right? And we and I think the first couple of months is what we've really been harp, harping on the most is what are the systems, right? What are the correct? What are the best systems um, for every? department for every different thing. Um, I have it on the top of one of our things. It's the James Clear quote, you don't rise to the level of your expectations, you fall to the level of your systems. So it's like as long as we have our systems that match our values and as long and as long as we're upholding them and we're and we're showing them and we're selling them, right? You can't just make up an arbitrary rule and say do this. They have to understand why. Like what is the end game of this? How does this make their life easier? It's like if you're selling somebody something. Like they if, if you want somebody to be on board with something They've got to know what's in it for them. So if we have all these systems, it's like, okay, this is this is how it's going to make your job easier. This is how you're going to be less stressed, how you're going to make more money, mm. how, the, how the rest of your customers are going to be happier, right? And then everyone goes, oh, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense versus just coming in and going, this is what we do, right? So I just think having systems that align with your values um, and your goals and then just – and that's, that's as slow as you go. And, when, and then when somebody – goes doesn't do the system there's not even any emotion involved it's like oh we we talked about this and just get back to that right 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 <clears throat> i think for me it would be you know and stop expecting me out of other people mm -hmm. you know because there's i know my worth ethic and right and for me to expect it out of everybody else it's like asking for something that's like you know really I don't want to say unattainable, but it's hard, you know, like I understand the, the hours and the days that have to be put in to, to reach that level of consistency, right? Like how do we stay consistent as a leadership team? Every day has to be the same as far as our routine goes. So how do we translate that to an hourly employee, right? It's hard, you know, and I think instead of expecting them to kind of 
match our grind is kind of related to what's something they they find familiar you know a lot of people are in the restaurant business not because they find it a passion like we do a lot of people are trying to get by school right they want to pay bills they have a family to take care of a lot of people this is a job it's not a passion so how do we translate passion into you know uh something that they're doing out of necessity right and it's just finding that relatable topic that you know for example we have a guy in the kitchen that has his own clothing brand you know hey listen like if you were to make these three shirts one way and then you made this other one sloppy and you sold it and the guy was unhappy right how would you feel about that would you give him a refund would you give him a new shirt like how would you feel about your shirts not coming out the same way Mm. and then their brains are like you know what yeah that's right like Mm. why would i do that you, you know perspective it's perspective you know and and it doesn't matter like they don't have to own a business right it could be some people are like yeah i like to paint all right so listen if you were painting and then this one painting wasn't to your liking would you do it again yeah it would so what's the difference between that and what you're doing now right, right? and I, for me that's the easiest thing for to to be able to kind of like you know get that out of the staff right because it's just hard nowadays you know it's different you know definitely relaxing and taking a breath as a leader too like it's not always like go 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 you know everybody get on right you know it's kind of i was talking to somebody earlier it's it's like different personalities and and, and different you know people in there and stuff like that it's just sitting down and and figuring it out right yeah and i think the hardest thing for me thinking about how i look at this industry right first as an investor Mm -hmm. i have a sharp investor's mind that's how i got into it right i have passions personal passions and i'm trying to mix my appetite to invest in great assets right great companies with my passions things that i enjoy talking about thinking about like what business can I create that I'm not going to hate mm-hmm. after 10 years of talking so much about it mm. and being there so much? And just like, it has to be something that you're going to enjoy, right. right? And for me, looking first at the coffee industry, analyzing all of the fastest growing, best coffee companies in the world right now, right? Blue Bottle being one of them. Gregory's in New York being one of them, Blank Street New York being one of them, right? Joe's Coffee Project in New York being one of them. There are some fast-growing, incredible craft coffee shops and companies emerging right now. And, And seeing that, being a consumer, understanding that I love this as a consumer, and also understanding from the investor side, wow, if only, right? What if I was the one to come up with that idea. Mm -hmm. What if I was an early, early, early? Now it's it's still too late, right? You could come in now and yeah, make some money at the the back end, but the real money is made as an investor when you are so close to this idea that you're like either you created it or you are at inception. You are Mm -hmm. one of the first five to 10 people to hear about this idea and get involved. Mm -hmm. Whether you're an employee, (laughs) or an investor, you have made it if you get in that early, right? We just went to Five Iron the other day and and played around and we met the GM and he literally was like their fifth employee ever at the very first one in New York. He started out literally picking up golf balls that would go errant, that would like fall out of the thing and like he would like grab people's golf clubs and, and, and bring them to people and like serve people beers. He was so low level, like it was entry level for, for this guy. And now he manages his own location. He's got a ton of shares. I think they were just bought by like Callaway or something. Mm-hmm. Like they were bought by a huge company. I think it was Callaway, right? Like he's, this, this guy's set, right? He climbed up from the very bottom and it's only because he was early, right? That's an, an investment as a career. Right? There's different ways to invest. You can invest time. You can invest money. You can invest a career opportunity. Right, But being able to capitalize on that is significant. And so the first thing with coffee was how do you, you – you see that these companies are doing well. right? The blue bottles of the world, even Black Rifle. right? Like they're doing really well. They're, they're growing really fast. What is it about these companies that, that make it great? Right, um, I think – I resonated with Blue Bottle the most because it was about the quality, 
right? They cared more about the quality than other companies, it seemed, right? Um, s- certainly more than Starbucks, Dunkin', Wawa, right? right? And I also noticed that cus- consumers are becoming more discerning. Mm-hmm. Their palates are becoming more, like, we're all becoming more snobby as a society because we have more information. Right. We have more and more information every day, every week, every month. We have more info. And so even the average consumer, the below average consumer in terms of knowledge, right, is th- that median is rising mm-hmm. every single second. And so Black Turtle was about capitalizing on that. So Blue Bottle has a single origin option. That's an option. That's an upgrade. Mm-hmm. What if we created a coffee company that only served single origin, premium grade, fair trade coffee, right? And so that's one piece. The other piece was, okay, people also like companies that roast their own beans because you can stand behind the product. I roasted this. We roasted this to our standards. We didn't buy it from a roaster who said, yeah, trust us, right? We actually manufactured this product, right? And we can make sure that the roast frequency is, you know, every two months, every one month, every six months, whatever it is. And for us, it was, okay, how can we be even better than that, right? Roasting beans three months ago is fine. Like, that's great. That's way better than the big coffee conglomerates, right? So that's okay. But how can we be even better? So it was like, okay, what if we roasted like every day? Mm-hmm. What if we roasted almost every day in small batches, right? You're supposed to let the beans oxidize and, and kind of release the gases for, for about 24 to 48 hours, right? But that's perfect consumption time. So 48 hours is perfect consumption. What if we roasted every day so that every bean that a customer consumed was that perfect 48-hour consumption time? And we grind everything to order, Right, that's the other piece. How long you you have beans that are already ground sitting there, getting stale, mm. right? Releasing all that flavor into the air, mm-hmm. and the customer can enjoy it. So we tried to take every single aspect of a great cup of coffee, and just be perfect on on all those fronts. And it's annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do. There's reasons why a lot of companies say "f it," and partly it's because most consumers don't have the palate to appreciate it or understand it. And so it seems like that effort is too much cost to have sufficient reward. But you have to be forward thinking, right? You have to have the foresight to, to see where the, where the market is going and say, no, 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 we're going to do this because it would be impractical for Starbucks to put a roaster in every single store. They're they're probably gonna die. They're not gonna be able to adapt, right? If you already have a team, uh, a, a set of of ten, twenty, thirty locations, right, that all have roasters <coughs> on site and they're set up and doing this already, you're you've built a brand surrounding that. It's very difficult to change up as the incumbent and say, oh no, now we're gonna serve quality things too, <coughs> right? Right. Because you've ruined that trust with the consumer, yeah. right? Because it's like, well, why weren't you giving me quality stuff before? It's like you betrayed them. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what were you doing before? <laughs> you can't go back. Right? Mm. There's a lot of things that people don't know about, like, what the Starbuckses of the world do. <coughs> and it makes sense. It's smart. Again, the same way that what McDonald's does is smart, Starbucks does smart things for their shareholders. It's smart because it's working. But you have to have the foresight to be able to disrupt and and do that. And I think we've we've done a, a number of, of different things that are similar with Kook Burger and that concept. Um, you know, but I'll, I'll let you guys kind of weigh in on, on some of those aspects that we're really trying to execute on at Kook Burger to d- be disruptive in the same way. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it, it, it's it's tough to say. Really, I mean, one thing I know that we take a lot of pride in is just not skimping on quality of of the ingredients, right? So, yeah, it's annoying um, getting the the fresh beef and making the balls ourselves and, like, you know, chopping all the veggies ourselves instead of buying pre-cut, you know, whatever nonsense. But it's like you said, like, it's that quality 
right that um, that people get addicted to, right? They come in and, and they and they know what they what they what they're gonna get, right? And it's the best, so they're gonna come back. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think that I think definitely the quality, right? It's like like Black Turtle, right? Shell out for the good stuff, right? You can get a burger anywhere you want to go. Like you can get a burger at McDonald's, right? You go to Wendy's, right? There's a billion burger spots in Philly and across the world, in and out, and whatever, right? And <coughs> you go to Kook Burger, and they're like, you know, how big are your burgers? Well, they're four ounces, <laughs> four ounces, right? And then when they yeah. eat the burger and they taste it and they get it, it was like, wow, that that was enough, you know? Like mm-hmm. I kind of could have ate another one, but they come back, right? And it's like the you know, we use good beef, you know, and, and it's it's hard to kind of, like, show people that process, right? Just like you said, like, there's, you know, they don't know what they're getting at Starbucks, right? I mean, maybe they do or they don't. There's a certain percentage of people that don't care, right? I think with food is a little different. People care what's going inside their bodies when they're eating it, right? you know? It's, it's, if they know. Right, <laughs> you know? And they, they sometimes people are like, well, what type of beef do you use? Frozen beef? No, you know? We don't use frozen beef. We use fresh ground beef. Right, that's prepped every day. Right, daily mm-hmm. fresh beef. We get deliveries every day, and then we put it on a plate for you so you can enjoy it and love it. Right, and it's just like Price said earlier. You know, when he sees somebody smile, or like take a picture of it and like leave that review, like wow, best burger I've ever had. That's you the know, best feeling. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a good feeling. It makes it all. You know, they shit me on their <laughs> table. They close their eyes and they're making mm-hmm. this smile. Shit. Right. <laughs> It's mm-hmm. it's definitely definitely has to be just the quality of our products that we use, you know. Even like the smallest thing, right? Like wilted lettuce. Like you go to a restaurant, you see wilted lettuce on your burger, your salad. You're like, what's this stuff, right? <laughs> and we know, like we, you know, we make sure our lettuce is fresh, right? Yeah. We get it fresh. We make sure we chop it up. We train our cooks to look everywhere yeah. to make sure, like, if that's not good enough to use. Throw it out. Get some fresh stuff, right? Because people pay thing, attention man. to it. Yeah. yeah, I try to train all all my cooks just like. If it's like, just be honest with yourself. The, that was the most important thing. Like, if it is burnt, I don't care how backed up we are. If it's burnt, throw it away and start mm-hmm. again. Someone is gonna, they'd much rather, I'll tell you right now, they'd much rather would wait an extra 10 minutes for an excellent burger than get it 10 minutes earlier and be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I try to teach that to, to everybody who, who works at Cook Burger. Um, and anybody listening, if you're inspired by that, <laughs> you know, um, take pride in your work, whatever you do. Check your lettuce. Be honest check with your, yourself. Check your check lettuce. Your lettuce. <laughs> Keep that shit fresh. Like, yeah. if it's wilted, if it's brown, just just throw it out and chop some new stuff. Like, don't try to use guac from three days ago. No, make a new batch. Like, we have the stuff. Yeah. We have yeah. the avocados. Like, mm-hmm. you know. I think, too, real quick with, um, you know, when you... you, you talked all about the coffee and the single origin stuff and you also have to be okay with or be prepared for the idea of there's also somebody that doesn't give a shit about any of it mm. and that's one of the big Seth Godin things that I always like when he talks about like whatever it is you do th- if somebody doesn't like it it's just like oh it's not for you he talks about writing books mm. it's like hey if he, get, he used to get a bad review he's like I don't re- read bad reviews anymore because it's like I don't. it's just not for you it's not, it's not for you so I think with Whatever, whatever echelon or whatever it is, you that is your thing. Just finding those people, getting it to, mm-hmm. getting it to the people, letting people try it, letting them decide, um, and then just making sure every, you know, if you're gonna have the best quality, everything, making sure we talked about before, like our standards, our service, the place matches that. Because you're right, people don't know it's a burger. You know, it's a burger joint. You're getting a burger, so to, to you want them to be able to taste it, to feel it in the service, to feel it in the atmosphere. To be like, oh, these people, this is a burger joint. Why am I getting such good service? Yeah. Like we talked about it before. We don't want to, we don't want to, we want people to be surprised mm-hmm. at how good it is. Not just like, oh, it's good enough. It's like, whoa, wh- you know, why is this, why does this feel, why does this feel uh, such an excellent level of service at like a fun little kooky burger, burger right. joint? And that's, that's something, that's something cool to strive for. It's, it's interesting on reviews because some bad reviews mm-hmm. will be fair. Sometimes you get a bad review and it's like, nah, eh, fair. You're being a little harsh, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, every one star review, it's like anytime you get a one star, it's like that's it's almost always uh, that's, a, that's a little harsh. But, yeah. you know, some of those you'll see and say, okay, 
fair, something did happen that harmed your experience. And so I understand why you felt the need to write this review, whether I believe that it's one star or maybe you could have given me three or four, right, is, is a different story. But I think, like, the other aspect of, like, when, when you know that you have honed in on something and that it's right and you can have that confidence, right, you develop that confidence over time. You don't in your first month say, it's not for you, you know, if you didn't like it, mm -hmm. F off. Right, but mm -hmm. over time, if you've been in business for a hundred years, if yeah. you've been in business for ten years, five years, three years, even, and you've had a certain level of success, and you know that you are executing properly, that your operations are stellar, then it does at some point become like it's not for you. Mm -hmm. But I also think one of the most challenging aspects is like when I think from my vantage point about how we created the menu and the ingredients that we selected the way that we reverse engineered everything, right? We talked about the coffee piece from my vantage point with Kook Burger and Kook Burger and Bar. It was about ingredients, but it's the process of how we selected those ingredients. When we went to the food distributor and selected those ingredients, first, first of all, we put them through the biggest pain in the ass ever. We had 10 or 20 different options for every single ingredient that we had to purchase as a restaurant. And that is a pain in the ass <laughs> for a food distributor in the test kitchen to have to have all those options prepared. It took literally three days, three full days of tasting stuff. And it's a pain. It was a pain for us, it was a pain for them. But our process there was unique and it was special, right? We blind taste tested everything, meaning we didn't want to know the name or the price before selecting it because we wanted to be unbiased and objective and select every single ingredient that tasted the best. Objectively, this is the best. We want this one. I don't care how much it is, right? I don't want you to tell me how much it is. I want that one. And then we move on to the next one. We want that one. And as you can imagine, what ended up happening was we selected much of the most expensive ingredients that you could buy. And at the, by the end of it, our guys at the food distributor were, were kind of laughing at us, right? They were like, wait, this is a, this is a burger joint, right? Like, this is a, a burger joint in Brigantine? It's a burger joint in Philly? Yeah. You're, doing, you're doing smash burgers? This isn't like, you don't have a Michelin star? Are you sure you want to spend this money, <laughs> this much money on cheese? Do you want to spend this much money on certified Angus beef? It's a, it's a Wolverine steak pack. Like you want to spend this much money? Yeah. And yes, it's like yes. I, I do. And and it was hard for me too. Like as the business owner who's supposed to be focused so much on cutting costs mm -hmm. and and trying to save a buck wherever you can. And I think that is like very much the old school way of thinking about it. Yeah. And I just personally, for whoever's listening or wants to know, I don't think that that is a sustainable model anymore. I don't think that that strategy is going to work in 2022, 2023, 2024. I don't think that that's where we're going as a society. Again, because I think the median of what that consumer is looking for it, it, people are starting to know and give a shit mm -hmm. more and more and more. And so that's what essentially Kook Burger's bet is. Some customers come in, they don't get it, they don't know, and they don't care that we bought the most expensive ground mm -hmm. beef yeah. that you possibly can buy. And that, but they come in and it does look like a casual environment. You go to Kook Burger, Kook Burger and Bar. It's a casual environment. We don't have white tablecloths, but we're serving Michelin quality food, and it just doesn't come in the package that you're accustomed to seeing fine dining, gourmet food come in, mm. and that is su surprising. It's also hard to detect. It's, it's much like you know you have wine experts who will try three different kinds of wine and get it wrong yeah. and, and pick the dollar stuff. Right, you, you have people make mistakes, right, in terms of the palate and being able to differentiate between something that's really high quality and what's not. But as a company, you just have to bet on people over time, the numbers statistically, that customers will appreciate the quality over time. It's funny, like you talk about reviews and like unfair one star reviews. Like, I remember when we first started the first Kook Burger, and so, like. A lot of the reviews that were low 
would say, what would they say? Like, best burger I ever had, but too pricey. Ooh, yeah, that's the hardest. And it's like, okay, well, how do you put a price on the best burger you've ever had? Yeah, that was and the how funniest. how is that a one-star review? Like, We literally got that nonsense. review. The best burger I ever had. Right. But way too expensive, way too one star. <laughs> like what? The <laughs> best Come burger on. you ever had, mm. you just gave us a one star because yeah. you thought it was too pricey. And that's the hard thing. Like, it, and for us, we price everything. We have standard, like literally I asked Vic, I was like, what is standard food cost margin on each item? And that we're going to price it in. We're not going to kill anybody on price, right? right? We're not like inflating margins on anything. We have the same average margins that, as everybody else. What you're paying for is literally only the ingredients being a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. You're just paying for the quality of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. There's no markup, right? Yeah. Um, Price re reflects quality, right? In a lot of, a lot of things. It right? often does. It, it yeah. Often does, yeah. But. Um, <laughs> You're right, and but I you just said something earlier too that was interesting. You said like the old school way about costs, mm -hmm. right? And I think if now like going to like this new age, right, 2023 and stuff like that, and and I see a lot of these fine dining chefs, and I have a lot of fine dining chefs that are going towards their own, you know, little thing, right? They they build their own restaurant stuff, and there's these Instagram pages where these chefs make fun of Michelin star restaurants, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, costs, and I think. If you're on the side that we are on, right, instead of looking at cutting costs, we look at food, staff, and things like that, like investments, right? We're investing in food to sell mm. to the guests who's coming in. It's potentially going to be like, it's, it's going to come back, right? right. It's, it's a good investment, a good investment in staff, mm -hmm. a good investment in, in, you know, other things that can potentially make us some money in return. And I think down the line after, you know, a few months of being open, then you can start looking at your costs, right? right. And that's when you start to see, you know, I think you look at two different glasses that look the same. Can you tell which one's cheaper? No. Okay, well, let's go with the glass that's more affordable to us. Don't right. cut costs on the food, right? right. Don't get right. cheap on the food because people, like you said, people are getting more sophisticated. They have a nicer mm -hmm. palate, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to go in and they're going to be like, yeah. This is the best burger I ever had, but it's too pricey, right? <laughs> or they're gonna be like, "Yeah, this burger don't taste like anything that mm -hmm. that should be this amount of price, right?" So, it, it's it's a weird world that we're living in right now, as far as that goes, right? But that that whole cost thing, it's like maybe it's done with, right? Maybe you go you go a little higher on food costs, and we can sit here and talk about food costs, liquor costs all day. But I don't want whoever's coming in and and grabbing a burger, <laughs> or they're enjoying, they're going out to a restaurant. They don't care about your food costs. Yeah. Right. They don't care right. about anything like that. If it slaps, like they'll be back. Yeah, Maybe. exactly. Yeah. If it slaps, they'll be back. And yep. if it sucks, then, like, shame on you yep. for serving something that sucks. Right. Like, right. You should take pride in, in, in what you're serving. Yeah. Right? So I know that we serve the best quality stuff. We're not cheaping out on any ingredients. And so it's like, hell yeah. If someone is like, yo, that's the best burger I've ever had, I'm like, hell yeah. But it's super pricey. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's super pricey, but, you, you know. I think to go back, I when, I, when, earlier when I said it's it's not for you, that the South Dakota thing, the point was being there. there's people have different tastes and there's they have different wants. Somebody, yeah. somebody like somebody, hey, man, I just might I just might want a Folgers coffee. Right. And I might just want a Wawa coffee. And I don't, and that's fine. There's, there's a market for everybody. But I think back to, like, it's the best burger they ever had. What I think is the most important thing for us is, is it the best burger we can make? Mm. And make it consistently because right. that's all we can control, is, yeah. right? Like this, like the serenity prayer. Right. right. Yeah, what can yeah. we control? Right. And can we consistently do that? And then we'll we have to let that speak for itself because yeah. somebody might be the best burger they ever had. Somebody's not. It's irrelevant. We have to be when we put it out and we look at it. Are we happy to put it out? Or are we like, oh, right. let's get it out. Let's get through this night. Yeah. It's like no, no, no. Like you said, if it's burnt, send it Start back. Start it over. And then if we can, if we keep that consistency, that's the trust. And those are the people that come back. Your regulars yeah. are the people that are like, yeah. "Oh, we like these people, we enjoy it, and we trust that when we come here, we're gonna and we're gonna send our friends because it's like the mob. It's like you vouch for this guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right? Like you know right. send your friends. Yeah. And you vouch, <laughs> you vouch for this burger, <laughs> right? And that's right. what that's what you want is people to to be like, yeah, go there, I'll vouch for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really where it all begins and ends. Mm -hmm. Once you have a great concept and a, g a great brand and vision and business plan 
to support the concept. Then it comes down to execution. And it really is about the investment in your staff, Mm -hmm. the investment in the food, which is typically baked into the concept itself. But and then the investment in the systems and in, in the learning and the training to assure that this is something that's replicable, right? Um, you know, because obviously our, our goal isn't to, to start and stop with one location. Mm. You know, we want to share this, not, not just for the money. It's when you create something and you put a lot of effort and time into it, talk about creating something as, as an art, right? Food being an art. When you get something just so, it's electrifying to share it. It's so satisfying and rewarding to share it with as many people as possible. And like every face, every happy face, right? And, and every satisfied customer that's like, wow, this was awesome. And they often don't know, right? Like I have so many conversations and like, Customers will love the burger. Best burger I ever had. Love that statement. Mm-hmm. And we've heard it a lot. We've been yeah. super fortunate. And when you hear that, like, they never, they don't know why, right? And it's like, well, like, let me tell you why. And branding and marketing, like, the goal of that is to try to tell people, whoever will listen, here's why. Like, here's all the things that we're doing. And you're right. Like, some people don't care, mm-hmm. right? Um, but you're trying to make sure everyone knows Mm -hmm. um, because it does inform perspective, right? Like if you went into a restaurant and you knew all these fun facts about Kook Burger and the way that they designed the menu and the care that was put into it, it's gonna, it's gonna hit different. It's gonna hit different than if you came in and you didn't have any idea and you thought it was some divey sports bar with who knows what, quality food right like it's going to change your perspective and so i think like that's that is part of it but at at the end of the day you have to be able to satisfy a customer that doesn't know and have the food speak for itself right you have to be able to do both you try to hit people with marketing but have the quality and consistency that no matter what when they come in the food the food's going to speak for itself anyway so um you know we got to wind up so Share some imparting kind of like last words. We'll, we'll go around, like keep it brief on some some items that, that you would want people to take away who either want to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs, are in the restaurant industry and, and want to be successful. Price, you want to go? You want me to go? Yeah, you go. Yeah, okay. Ladies first. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, You're a good lady. I mean, if, shoot. Follow your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Short no, and sweet. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to say, too, like, you know, if it, if it feels right, do it. Like, don't be afraid to take a risk. Um, obviously, entrepreneurship is a huge risk. Um, but if you're passionate about it, uh, you know, you're going to lose a lot of sleep. You're going to be stressed. You're going to be worried about your business doing well. Um, but if it feels right, do it. And I promise you, like, it will work. Like, if you stay committed to your craft and you connect with the right people and you just keep doing what you love, I mean, it will work. So do it. Do it. Yeah. Uh, mine's short. Just like, you know, don't to be, don't be too hard on yourself. Right. Take it easy. Um, take it easy, you know, and it's progress, not perfection. Don't beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, I'll actually finish it kind of where you started it. You mentioned, um, you know, people people wanted people have ideas. People are like, oh, I want to start a restaurant. Like everyone's got ideas, right? If you don't lo- like, if you don't love, if you don't want this, you don't. If you don't, if people want to open a restaurant. If you want to open a restaurant, you better prepare to be there every day. Mm-hmm. Like it's not this pie in the sky thing. I just want to be the owner and show up. Like. You're, there's going to be days where you're fixing the dishwasher or doing dishes or running to the store to get something you ran out of. So, like, I think people kind of romanticize entrepreneurship or ownership of, like, oh, I'm just, I have this idea and it's going to be great. And it's like, whoa, somebody's got to hold it together. Somebody's got to be there and, and put put skin in the game. You're right, nothing's for free. So I would say that's kind of off prices thing. Like, not only do you gotta do you, you got to have a passion for it, but, like, if you don't, um, really think about what it takes to to do it successfully, because um, you'll be you'll be surprised. <laughs> For sure. Uh, 
Well, thank you all so much for for being on the show. Um, I am incredibly grateful for each and every one of you guys. Um, we have an amazing team, and uh, couldn't literally couldn't do it without you guys. It's a pleasure um, to be on the Braden Anderson show. Yeah. Love it, love it. <laughs> thanks for having me, and thanks all the the listeners tuning in. Braden Anderson show out. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.